I'm Dwayne Brown. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, leading the way for the electric grid in the United States. We play war, right? And so on the military installation, we can red team and we can basically attack our infrastructure from a cyber point of view. The military mission taking a micro approach to power needs and the private citizens following their marching orders. And when is it too early to get breast cancer treatment? I'm Peggy Pico. Why a new study says surgery for stage zero breast cancer does not improve survival rates. Then, more than a dozen wildfires continue to burn in California and in the Pacific Northwest. How new San Diego technology could help firefighting efforts. Sunny side up, scrambled or poached, it's going to cost you more for that carton of eggs. What's behind the increase? KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Hi, good evening. Thanks for joining us. Addressing climate change. Scripps Institution of Oceanography will study the impact thanks to funding announced today. The Center for Climate Change Impacts and Adaptation will focus on what can be done to deal with environmental changes like rising sea levels. Scripps is one of only a few institutions capable of doing this type of research. We had people from all around the world talking about how to address these issues of climate change adaptation and particularly the problems of rising oceans. And it was clear throughout that these are huge problems, but they're problems which an institution like this one, and particularly this one now with, just, with this gift, can help to address. Scripps has been a hub for research on climate change since the 1950s. KPBS science reporter David Wagner has more on how they're planning to address how we'll live in a world shaped by environmental changes. Officials from UC San Diego and the Scripps Institution of Oceanography announced the new center at a press conference Monday morning. The Center for Climate Change Impacts and Adaptation is launching with a $5 million donation from Delmar philanthropists Carol and Dick Hertzberg. Scripps director Margaret Leinen says the center's mission will be to address hazards like sea level rise, volatile weather, and climbing temperatures. So now that we know that climate is changing and now that we know how much of it we're responsible for, the big questions are what are the impacts of that climate change and what can we do to adapt to it. Climate researcher Dan Cahan says scientists know sea levels could rise by about three feet in the next century, so they should start studying how areas like San Diego will adjust. As you notice these beaches that we have here uh, along La Jolla Shores are not very steep, so an increase in say eight inches or so can bring wave energy farther on shore. The center will not be housed in any new facilities. Instead, it will hire a director to focus ongoing local research on real-world problems. Leinen hopes that focusing on adapting to the reality of climate change will lead to more action on fighting its root causes. Perhaps seeing how much we'll have to adapt and how much it will cost will give us the inspiration and the will uh, to deal with emissions now so that we don't have to adapt to even bigger impacts later on. David Wagner, KPBS News. Transforming Young Lives with Science, a San Diego nonprofit will soon bring a bit of the ocean to City Heights. The Ocean Discovery Institute has reached its $15 million goal to build a science facility in the neighborhood near the entrance of Manzanita Canyon. This is where they've been teaching kids how urban runoff pollutes canyons and eventually reaches the ocean. The facility is expected to open in January 2017. Counting down to the ultimate reality show starring marine life off the California coast, Big Blue Live debuts one week from tonight, highlighting the thriving ecosystem at Monterey Bay Aquarium. The three-night series starts at 5 p.m. on Monday, followed by a special broadcast of Evening Edition. Tests confirm the county's first human case of West Nile virus. Health officials say a 73-year-old Del Mar man appeared with symptoms earlier this month and is hospitalized with West Nile. The virus is transmitted to humans, birds, horses, and other animals by infected mosquitoes. Last year, there were 11 local West Nile cases. Two of the patients died. 
A San Diego fire crew is helping battle wildfires in Washington state. Fire crews have made progress on some fires. 15 local members of the Urban Area Incident Management Team are on site tonight. As wildfires continue to rage, Peggy Pico shows us new technology that may help San Diego's future firefighting efforts. Weather patterns and terrain play a major role in firefighting efforts. But what works best in Northern California's Jerusalem fire, for instance, won't necessarily work well for San Diego wildfires. That's where the new SIM table at San Diego State University and a weather sensor network could help. Here with how are my guests, SDSU Viz Center Director Eric Frost and SDG&E Senior Meteorologist Stephen Vanderberg. Welcome to Evening Edition. Nice to be here. Thank you. Now, Eric, uh, what is this new and improved SIM table and how does it work? It's, it's new and improved in a profound way because our world is new and improved. Like with smartphones, that's way different and uh, social media. So this is taking the old of being able to sculpt sand like military people used to do for thousands of years and, and now overlaying imagery on top of that so that you can now model what the fire is gonna do. You see it in three dimensions, but you can actually also now overlay things like social media. So you have now millions of sensors that are bringing data for one monitor, which is now in three dimensions. And so that now with the, the new version of SimTable developed um, in New Mexico um, is an absolutely extraordinary tool to help people that have to make a decision, and like all of us if we had to evacuate, how we would understand might largely be how do we get the data, and now we can do it with very expensive things like YouTube. Okay. Uh, and, and, and so we could then respond. Okay. And, and so, so kind of it sounds like it. a crowdsourcing, and we saw yes. the 3D animation there. Uh, can firefighters access this right now? Um, it's, it's actually something that the way we're doing it, what we're doing with it right now is understanding how you would use it for evacuations, for protecting firefighters, for, our, for putting it um, into social media, for getting it out of social media. So this absolutely is something that you know, SDG&E could use it, the fire department could use it, the CAL FIRE could use it. Um, but it's, so it's available. It's available and it's bringing together things that are also available to them like social media. But do they use it? And okay. they're just starting to do that? Let's, we'll come back to that access question, but I want to get to Steve first, because there's a, a wildfire uh, weather sensor network that was set up last year in uh, San Diego's uh, back county. What are these sensors, and, and what do they measure? Well, the sensors you're talking about is our network of 170-plus weather stations. We actually started that process uh, five, six years ago, and what those are is a collection of weather stations that give us readings on wind, wind speed, wind direction, temperature, humidity, um, and they send that data back to us and the public and the fire agencies and the weather service every 10 minutes. And not only that, but this, this, these weather stations that are out there are calibrated annually, so we know that the data is good and we can rely on that data. And it's accurate. Something else you also developed is a category system for Santa Ana events, which we know fuels uh, fires, especially here in the fall. So how is that information shared with other agencies, including the SIM table? So the Santa Ana Wildfire Threat Index is available through SantaAnaWildfireThreat.com. Not only that, but the county through uh, their SD Emergency app pushes that uh, information out. And basically what that is, is a decision support tool. Uh, that's available to everyone in this county, including first responders and the public, that tells them what's the potential for large fires with the Santa Ana. And it does so by rating each event just like uh, hurricanes get rated. You know, so hurricane is a cat one through cat five. Mm -hmm. This gets rated on a scale from marginal to extreme. And when you start getting into those high and extreme ratings, that's when we're talking about the potential for events like October 2007. Or October 2003. How is this information, I'll start with you Eric, how is this information uh, shared or is it shared between the two groups and, and other agencies gathering this type of uh, information that would be helpful for firefighters and for people yeah. just living here? In a, in, a, in a sense the time of being here at KPBS is remarkable in that sense is that you are an, um, a, um, a, a forcing factor to have a lot of things take place. So they have data, we have a device, you could put them together and then we're both sharing it out in a, uh, because our, our goal for both both groups is how do you actually protect the, and, and help the people of the region and, and what KPBS championed in an extraordinary way in the 2007 fires was the crossing the border sure. and, and so what could be done with these data sets and what their data set does in a remarkable way it also has information from south of the border right so uh, we'll have to end on this but um, will you be 
using this in working with, let's say, SimTable or other organizations like uh, like SDSU's uh, Viz Center? Well, all of that data that we've generated, which I only briefly touched on here, uh, we frequently share with, with folks like Eric so that we can take these tools to the next level. All right, so much more to uh, learn about as things come up. Steve Vanderberg and Eric Frost, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. Scrambling on Wall Street, a volatile day for investors as stocks slump. The Dow plunged by more than 1,000 points at the start of trading. The index closed down 588 points by the end of the trading day. The slump is part of a global wave of selling, triggered by increased signs of an economic slowdown in China. And this is a sell-off that's uh, pretty much made in China. It's a reaction to great uncertainty about the direction of the Chinese economy and whether uh, the Chinese authorities have a handle on, on, on how to manage their economy. Coming up on the PBS NewsHour, experts offer a perspective on what this volatility means. That starts at 7 tonight, right here on KPBS. Expect to shell out more for eggs. The benchmark egg prices are up by 150 percent. A dozen large eggs went for $1.45 last August. The price is now up to $3.61 for the same carton a year later. Experts blame an avian flu outbreak killing millions of domestic chickens and turkeys. They also point to higher chicken feed prices and Proposition 2. The new law regulates how farmers house chickens producing eggs sold in California. The U.S. electric grid has been called the world's largest machine, but it's starting to show its age. The answer may be smaller grids, and the U.S. military is leading the way. Inside Energy's Dan Boyce says it's all in the name of national security. Ready for a ride? Here we go. Raymond Crockett is a supply specialist at Fort Carson Army Base. Um, you can basically consider us kind of like a Home Depot or uh, Ace Hardware for the, the post. He spends much of his day in a delivery truck, hauling stuff here and there. Here's your parts. All right, sir, you have a good day. All right. But when Crockett shows up and when he leaves, it's with a whisper. Yeah, it's, it's nice. All the guys say I stick up on them. <laughs> his truck is one of a small fleet of electric vehicles driving around Fort Carson ranging from carrying refrigerated goods to weapons to troops heading out to train. We really don't care what the vehicle does for its mission. It's just the fact that it's an electric vehicle that's doing it instead of a gasoline engine. Bill Wagaman leads energy security for U.S. Northern Command, the military's homeland defense arm. Fort Carson's electric vehicles make an important piece of the project on Wagaman's shirt. It's one of those clever government acronyms. SPIDERS is a smart power infrastructure demonstration for energy reliability and security. Uh, let's just stay with calling it SPIDERS. Fort Carson is hooked up to the same electricity grid we all use, which is reliable the vast majority of the time. But Vince Guthrie, the base's utility manager, says independence has its advantages. If we ever run into that crisis someday where we have a long-term electric outage, you know, a hurricane, tr Katrina, some type of disaster, a terrorist event. If something like that happens, Spiders allows Fort Carson to run on its own power generated on site. From these solar panels, diesel generators, and yeah, the electric trucks. In an emergency, the trucks can plug in and act as storage batteries for the electricity generated. Fort Carson is like a small village with houses and schools, but of the 95 buildings here, Wagaman says Spiders only really needs to be concerned with powering a few. They really only have three that we absolutely have to maintain the power to in order to do the mission. Like the data center and the headquarters command post. All of this helps with the security at this military base, makes the power here more reliable, but the suite of technologies being developed here could one day be implemented in all kinds of other sectors. And it already is. Some hospitals, jails, and universities have microgrids. 
Usually, though, they rely on diesel generators. Fuel tankers have been anchored offshore in New York Harbor, waiting for the ports to open. Residents of hard-hit areas in New York and New Jersey have been suffering through major gas shortages. During Superstorm Sandy, diesel shortages racked the East Coast. Wagaman says generators failed in multiple hospitals from overuse. Renewables and batteries could make these microgrids more reliable. The military is an important testing ground for making sure these systems work. We play war, right? And so on the military installation, we can red team and we can basically attack our infrastructure from a cyber point of view. We have to pilot these things so we realize what the potential is in the future. So you can, you can have some lessons learned and, uh, and you can help drive those markets because a lot of these companies are still evolving their technologies. Well, this would be known as a utility scale microgrid. Some entrepreneurs though are trying to get ahead of the markets. We're heading north out of the Fort Collins, Loveland, Greeley area. Craig Harrison works in real estate and out in an empty square mile of northern Colorado pasture next to a 30,000 acre bison ranch. Here we are. Here we are. He has a vision, the Niobrara Energy Park. The world's largest planned microgrid. Because while this may seem like we're out in the middle of nowhere. Yet you're in the middle of everywhere when it comes to the infrastructure. Harrison Square Mile sits at the intersection of major electric transmission, natural gas pipelines, and one of the largest fiber optic hubs in the country. He wants to pool those resources and combine them with renewables on site. And then create secure power for mission critical items like data centers or military facilities that could be within this secure area. He's trying to court the big guys, the Googles or the Apples to come in and build. And he hopes to convince them his microgrid could be cheaper than buying the expensive diesel generators data centers normally rely on. He thinks the project could be worth $10 billion one day if microgrids really are the future. Green Tech Media Research says there are more than 120 microgrids in the country right now, and they predict the market for microgrids will grow nearly 270% by 2020. For Inside Energy, I'm Dan Boyce. This Inside Energy report was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. When you're home in front of your television, like right now, there might be someone on the other side of the screen watching you, and that has some consumer groups concerned. The so-called smart television can be snooping and recording your conversations. It's being blamed on a loophole that may allow consent by consumers. State lawmakers are trying to get that changed by making recordings illegal. Peggy Pico takes a closer look at a new study about women surviving breast cancer and what it could mean for the future of the treatment. 60,000 Americans are diagnosed with stage zero or what some call the earliest form of breast cancer each year. Standard treatment can include a lumpectomy, mastectomy, or other treatment. But after Toronto researchers found surgery does not improve survival rates in these cases, the question of how to treat but not over-treat cancer is on the table. Joining me is breast cancer survivor and blogger Donna Pinto and Dr. Rima Batra, medical oncologist at Sharp Grossmont Hospital. In Dr. Batra, briefly describe what many people refer to as stage zero breast cancer. What is it? We call it um, DCIS or ductal carcinoma in situ and what that means is that we have found um, cancerous appearing cells inside the ducts um, that are in the breast. So they have not invaded into the breast tissue but, but they are in the ducts and so the concern is is that eventually they will turn into an invasive breast cancer. So and that's how it's been treated up to this point but this study looked at a hundred thousand patients and it was published in the prestigious uh, Journal of American Medical Association or JAMA mm -hmm. oncology issue. So will this study do you think stop surgeries or the current standard treatment in dealing with DCIS? I don't think the standard of care is going to change based on this study because um, this unfortunately wasn't a randomized controlled trial that was looking at prospective data and that's usually when we hold ourselves back and say okay let's change the standard of practice now but I do think this is going to fuel studies going forward. So the studies just to be clear looked at actually patient records of a hundred thousand people right, over that's 20 right. years but nothing of the actual patients 
as they were undergoing treatment. No, no. I see, I see. Now, Donna, uh, you were diagnosed with DCIS yeah. in 2010. Uh, how were you treated? So I had surgery which um, diagnosed the DCIS. It was called a wide excision, which I didn't even know at the time was really the same as a lumpectomy. Um, so at that point, I had a positive margin and was advised to have a mastectomy or a partial mastectomy plus seven weeks of daily radiation. And that's when I said, um, I didn't want to do those standard treatments and I looked into um, the alternatives and um, just did a lot of research and I found some doctors that were saying we're over treating this and sure. that a lot of these could likely just be nothing and I don't even think that it is cancer. So you you um, opted out of the surgical treatments, you became a nutritionist, you've, you've done yes. some other alternative treatments. How are you dealing with the cancer now? Or how, I shouldn't say right. the cancer, I the TCIS cancer, right. uh, uh, you know, the calcifications right, right now. I, I consider it a condition that is, um, some are likely to become cancer and some aren't. So I just go about my life in a very healthy manner. I do a lot of yoga and exercise and I'm a nutritionist, I eat very well and take all those integrative strategies. And then I also monitor every year with an MRI or ultrasound or a thermogram. So that's that you are still monitoring and watching. So yes. uh, Dr. Botcher, this brings me to, regardless of treatment options, uh, with this study in mind, uh, what would you tell your patients about breast cancer prevention or treatment of DCIS right now? Well, I would still put um, on the table the standard treatment options that they have, the lumpectomy versus um, the mastectomy. Um, but if somebody comes to me with this article, I think we can have an educated discussion about doing watchful waiting. Um, the study did point out patients who are higher risk um, for invasive cancer, um, and those patients, um, I probably would not go along with a plan like Donna's, but I think you know we can always talk about doing watchful waiting in, certain, in a certain subset of patients. And Donna, that brings me to one of your blog points out that yeah. not a whole lot of people were aware of DCIS. Right. Um, again, thinking of this article now and it's out on the table right. here, how do you think people should educate themselves about what it is and the options? Because there are those people who may have, right. uh, uh, be at a higher risk of it turning into cancer. Well, I think anyone that has a mammogram needs to be aware of DCIS as a possibility because so many people are diagnosed through mammography. It doesn't show as a lump. You don't feel anything. You're asymptomatic. Most women are healthy. So um, they need to be educated on what DCIS is rather than be shocked and then thrown into these treatment choices and, and not have you know, the knowledge. So my blog, DCIS 411, really kind of shares that information plus resources um, so that women For can know that they have options, right. and that there is Make this it, alternative thought process about active surveillance. Sure, some, uh, so, some, uh, like you say, some thought process and in going into it. And we have to end very quickly on this, Dr. Batra. Uh, what would you like to see happen? Would you like to see another study, and will this change your practice? I definitely think we need to do another study. Um, I think there it hasn't been a secret that we're over-treating this disease, um, and so I think we do need a prospective trial. And I do know that there are some things that are in the works now, so um, hopefully in the next few years we'll see some new data that can help us change our practice. All right, Dr. Rima Batra and Donna Pinto, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I'm Judy Woodruff on the next News Hour. We return to New Orleans for a week-long series, Katrina 10 Years Later. That's Monday on the PBS News Hour. Few artists can paint sports or Native American art with the soulful style of Gene Locklear. After spending a decade playing Major League Baseball in the 1960s and 70s, he left the sport to become a professional artist who lives in El Cajon. When you walk into people's homes, how many of them really have original artwork? I mean, they can buy prints, they can buy posters, they can buy photographs. Uh, they can do, uh, buy a lot of things that's a lot cheaper than original artwork. At 66 years old, Gene Locklear is still competing to be the best and feeling the changes of life along the way. I used to work 12 hours a day. Uh, at my age now, I just cannot do that because of my eyes and uh, arthritis and all the other things that hit us when we get in the 60s. But his creative juices are still flowing, from colorful Native American abstracts and portraits to very detailed paintings of sports figures commissioned by the NFL, PGA, even the White House. His latest work captures Mr. Padre, the late Tony Gwynn finishing a perfect swing, 
something Locklear strived for when he played for the San Diego team back in the 1970s. This is the best uh, shot that I've ever found of him as far as to end up with a, a great painting because also of the lighting. If you look at the lighting, the lighting is great where it makes, you know, lighting is very important when you're doing a piece of art, especially in sports, because it gives you that three-dimensional effect. His first piece of art sold for $5. Today, Locklear's commissioned work sells for between five and $20,000 a piece. Locklear broke down racial barriers by becoming the first member of the Lumbee tribe from North Carolina to play professional sports. He spent 10 years in Major League Baseball, playing outfielder for the Cincinnati Reds, the Padres, and New York Yankees. San Diego bracing for another heat wave later in the week. A few more days of mild weather, though, along the coast. Uh, temperatures in the 80s. Possible showers tomorrow in the inland valleys with 90s there. 80s expected with plenty of sun in the mountains and more showers possible, even with lightning in the desert, triple-digit temperatures. Here's a look at what we're working on for tomorrow in the KPBS newsroom. On Midday Edition at noon, a revealing study about the sex trade in northern Mexico that finds the youngest workers are the most exploited. That's tomorrow on KPBS Radio. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash Evening Edition. Thanks for joining us. You have a great night.